right. <clears throat> if you are not already there, please turn to Luke chapter 2. I thank the Lord for the opportunity to be able to stand before you today and uh, declare the word of the Lord. Known as 
a word. And the Greeks thought of the word logos as the logic. It is the reason that actually brought uh, uh, order to the chaos of this world. That's the way they thought of the word. The reason and the logic that brought order to the chaos of this world. And here in the verse is saying that there's one who is the word. And he's God. But, but at the same time, it says, says, and the word was God, and the word was with God. God. So, so he is a separate and distinct person. He was with God. He was beside him. He was there with the Father. But he is in and of himself also shares in the nature of deity of God. And so he is with God. Let's see the next verse. And he is God. The same was in the beginning with God. See that? Verse 3. And all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that wasn't made. That means he can't be made. He is the creator of all things. He is the maker of all things. And let's put up John 1.14. Because it tells us that this one who is the creator and the maker of all things. The word, the reason, the logic that brings order to the universe. Became flesh. And he dwelt among us. He dwelt among us. You see that? And we beheld his glory. The glory as what? The only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and full of truth. This is what we're talking about here. And so what we're saying is that he is the creator of the world. He's the same one who was in the beginning in Genesis. Can we look at that? Genesis 1-1. If we can get that on the board. He is the same one who was in the beginning. We'll see here that in the beginning... The, the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. You see that? And look at the next verse. It says, it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. You see that? Chaos. Without form. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. You see that? So we got two persons operating there. Look at the next verse. And God said, What is that? His word. Let there be light. His word is going forth. So we see three persons operating at creation. We see the Father operating, the Spirit operating, we see the Word operating. Who is the Son of God? The triune God is the creator of the universe. That's who we see operating there and working and uh, bringing order. You see that? Bringing order to chaos. Bringing order to that which they had no form and was still void. They are working to be able to bring order. And they're bringing order to the chaos of mankind. That's what I want you to see. The triune God brings order to the chaos of mankind. And he does it through his word. The person of Jesus Christ by his spirit sent by the Father to save sinners. Exodus 20. 11 says that in six days he created the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that dwell therein. He's the maker of all things. He's not, he came and he walked on this planet. He wasn't a phantom. He wasn't just the appearance of being human. He was really human. He was a real man. First, first Timothy 3, 3.16 says, says it like this. And without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. You see it? That's the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. He wasn't just a phantom. He wasn't just uh, an appearance. He was a real man. First John chapter uh, 1. Uh, let's just turn there. Let's do some flipping. First John chapter 1, I want you to see this because John tells us, or in First John we're told that, <clears throat> that look, this, this is not just an appearance, and this was something that, that uh, was necessary to be made known, okay, uh, in this epistle of John because uh, people would say that, oh, he, was, he just appeared. He just seemed like he came as a man. No, he really came as a man. And this is what he's saying here. He says that uh, in verse 1, John 1, 1. 
he says, that which was from the beginning, right? The word, which we heard, which we have seen with our own eyes. You see that we've seen them with our own eyes, which we have what? Looked upon, we perceived him, we understood him to be a man fully. And our hands have handled him. We've loved him. Our hands have handled him of the word of life. For the light was manifested, in verse 2, and we have seen it in bear witness and show, it unto, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was made known unto us, which was manifested unto us. You see it? And so they say, look, no, 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 he's not no phantom. He was a real man. He was a real man. He was really God. And uh, that real man was fully God. He had all the omnis of God. He was omnipotent, and omnipresent, and omniscient. And, uh, we talked about it on Friday. We talked about uh, Revelation 5, 6, where it talks about uh, the lamb who was there who had seven horns that depicts his, his perfect power and seven eyes that depicts his, his all-seeing eye. He sees all things. He's everywhere, right? And then his seven spirits that depicts his knowledge, his perfect knowledge of all things. This is the one that actually walked on this earth. Now, if you saw a man who had that type of power, would you be afraid? Would you be afraid? But here's what's beautiful. Hebrews 7.26 tells us that he was holy, harmless, separate from sinners. You know what that means? He was gentle. He was approachable by men and women and children to come to. Isn't that wonderful? Y'all powerful, harmless, hallelujah. That means that we can come to him. And he has the power to be able to do and meet all of our needs. The one, this one walked among us was a real man. If this is true, we should seriously consider him. Because, and it is true, God really came as a man. Jesus declared his deity. We're going to look at just a couple uh, texts here I just want you to see. Let's look at uh, John 5.18. If you look there in your Bibles. And let's get uh, John 20, 28 on the, on the overhead. And it says, uh, John 5, 18, the, the, the Jews are, are going after Jesus, <laughs> are going after Jesus. But G, in verse 17, it says, but Jesus answered them, my father worketh here too, and I work. <laughs> you know what he's saying? Just like my father works, I, I work just like him in every part. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him. Because not only had he broken the Sabbath, so-called, but said also, he didn't break the Sabbath. They said he did. But said also that God was his father. They got that part right. Making himself what? Equal with God. You see it? And so being the son of God made him equal with God. God being his father. And didn't the Lord, uh, didn't the Lord God testify of that? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. You don't have to put it up. Right? He testified at his baptism that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then Thomas declared it, didn't he? And Thomas wasn't believing at first. Thomas was doubting, but then he even declares it. And Thomas answered and said unto the Lord, my Lord and my God. And the scriptures declare in 1 John 5, 20, if we can get that up, the scriptures declare very clearly, don't ever think that God, that the Lord Jesus Christ did not declare that he was God. Yes, he did. I had somebody, I was getting my hair cut one time. The barber started talking to me. <laughs> you know how they be talking. And, and uh, he's like, like oh, Jesus never declared that he was God. Yes, he did. He said he was God all over the place in so many different ways. It's unbelievable. And the scriptures clearly declare that he's God. Look at it right here. And we know that the Son of God is come. 
and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. That's in Jesus. You got it? Know him that is truth. He is the truth, the way and the life. That's Christ. And that we're in him that is true. He's talking about Jesus, right? Ephesians 1. And we are in him that is true. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. Now, I like how the, I like how the NIV and the ESV said. You know what they say? It says there, he is the true God and eternal life. You got it? Jesus is God. He's the true God. He is a deity in and of itself. Now, when we think about this reality, Jesus declaring that he's God and the scriptures declaring that he's God and, and the scripture constantly saying this, if Jesus is going around declaring that he's God, I want you to think about this. Now, either he's a lunatic and he's totally off his rocker or he's God in the flesh. Matthew 1, 23, please. Matthew 1, 23. He, or he's God in the flesh. And I declare that the latter is true, right? Behold, a virgin shall, shall be, with a chi- be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name, what? Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. And this is who the Lord Jesus Christ was. He was God with us, and he was fully man. He was fully man. As we move down, he says <clears throat> he was God with us, but he was uh, he was also fully man. We can look at a few scriptures here, but I, I don't want to take you to too many of them for the sake of time. He was fully man. Matthew uh, 121 says that he was born of a virgin. He was born into this world by a woman. Matthew 121, Matthew 125 says that he was born of uh, into this world. Matthew uh, 21, 18 says that he hungered. John 19, 28, he said, I thirst. He had all the characteristics of a human being physically. And then the shortest verse in the Bible, you guys know what that is? John 11, 35, he, he wept. Jesus wept. Mark, uh, can we get Mark 3, verse 5 up? Mark 3, verse 5. So he uh, demonstrated it physically. He demonstrated it psychologically. He demonstrated it emotionally that he was a real man. And when he had looked around about on them with anger, because they was looking at him crazy because he was trying to heal them on the Sabbath. Can you believe that? I'm trying to heal a man. He must be crazy. Round about on them with anger. He looked what? Anger. Right. He had all kind of emotions too. Yet it was righteous anger. Let's get it straight. Okay? It was righteous anger. He, he, in him was no sin. And so being grieved, you see that? Being grieved for the hardness of their heart, he saith unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. You see that? And so he showed all of the emotional, psychological, physical characteristics of a man. And then I want you to see this. Turn to uh, Matthew 27. So he, uh, he was a uh, fully man. He, he, he was born. He hungered. He thirsted. Right? He had to work. Right? Like, like we do. Uh, to be able to, to live in this world. Right? And then in Matthew 27, verse 6, you know what also he did? He suffered. And he died. Matthew 27, 26, it says, And they had then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he would deliver him to be crucified. But look what they did to him. Verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall. See that? And gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him. You know what that means? They took his clothes off. They humiliated him. Have you ever been humiliated? He's like us. They humiliated him. They stripped down his clothes. 
And it says, and put on him a scarlet robe. They mocked him. Have you ever been mocked? He was mocked. And when they had planted a crown of thorns and put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, see it? They put a crown of thorns on his head. They mocked him, uh, mocking his rulership. And he put the thorn on his head as a sign of a curse. This world is cursed. Thorns and thistles it should bring forth. So he wore a crown of thorns. They stripped him. They humiliated him. They put crown of thorns on his head. And they, 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 they put a reed in his head. They bowed, uh, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hell, King of the Jews. And look at this. And they spit upon him. And that, at that time, was the worst type of shame that you could take upon yourself. For another human being to get in your face. And to declare that you are a nasty thing. You're nastier and not even worthy for my spit to fall upon you. And look at what happens. Seeing hell Jews and they spit upon him. And they took the reed and they smote him on the head. You see that? And if we look, drill down into the text and into the grammar, it's actually saying that they kept smiting. They didn't just beat him once across the head. The depiction there is one who's beating and beating and beating. It's as though they're beating him and they're calling him names. You lying, thieving, backstabbing, rebellious, thief, murderer, robber, disease, unprofitable, servant, idolater fornicator, adulterer, you deserve everything that I'm giving unto you. He became a real man, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He wore the curse of the crown that it might be removed from us. Galatians 3.13 3, he became a real man for sinners. If you are not trusting in this Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, I'm talking about the God-man, Jesus. You shall die in your sins. That's what the scriptures say. John uh, 8.34. I believe it is. Uh, John 8.23. Can we get that up? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. This is the answer. 24. Sorry. <clears throat> is a servant of sin. He said, therefore, unto you, that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, and the he is not there in the original. It means if you believe not that I am, that I am the self-existing one, the one who Moses talked about and spoke to in Exodus 3.14, who proclaimed, I am that I am. If you believe that I am, that I, that if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. Because it means that you're trusting and believing in another Jesus. And there's only one Savior for men. There's only one true Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, the, if you're not trusting in him, you're in trouble. Please turn to Christ if you're not. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. His humanity... His humanity increases our culpability. Meaning, what I mean by that is, is increases our guilt. You see, because his humanity, the, the fact that he came as a man. Listen, 
The Bible declares in, in Jeremiah 17, 9, that our hearts are deceitful above all things. They're desperately wicked, okay? Romans 3, 23 says that we all fall short of the glory of God. And the word there actually means we keep on coming short. And we have to answer to God. Acts 17, 30 tells us that we need to repent and turn to God because he's going to judge us. And the Lord God has sent his prophets into this world. He sent his prophets. And to come and tell us the truth. He sent Noah back in the day. He was a preacher of righteousness. And he uh, uh, sent uh, all kind of prophets throughout time. And he sends preachers out right now preaching the gospel, calling men and women to turn to Christ. And the prophet in the scripture is the spit of God. I just want to touch on this real, real quickly. When, I talk, when we talk about the prophet in the scripture, we're talking about the spit of God. We're talking about spokesmen that God actually sent, that our spokesman is the S. The P is to preach prophecy. That is to declare the Lord Jesus, who is the spirit of prophecy. Uh, Revelations 19.10, if we can get that up. Prophets are those who are spokesmen of God. They speak God's word. They speak his testimony. And they speak it because they are inspired by the spirit of God. Uh, John 16 tells us that the spirit takes the things of Christ and shows it unto us. So if they are so-called prophets led by the spirit of God, they should be preaching the testimony of prophecy, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. And so uh, they speak the prophecy and, and they do so, uh, they speak God's word alone and they do so to be able to turn men and women to God. That's the purpose. Not for people to look upon them, not to be lifted up, not to build a big church, to glorify God. To glorify God. I'm not going to go into it any deeper. I have some more stuff on here, but I, I, I know that I'm not going to, I need to move forward. So the Lord sent his spokesman, his spit, his S-P-I-T. God, but God did not just send his spokesman. He sent his angels. We see it in Luke chapter 2, verse 13. Luke 2, uh, 2 13. Remember uh, the shepherds were in the field? The angels came and they break open the sky and start praising God. And look at what they say. And suddenly there was with the angel in the multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, verse 14. Look at what they say. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men at the birth of Jesus Christ. They were saying, bless our men. Good will is coming to men. Guess what? Condemnation is not. Condemnation is not yet here. Good will towards men. Favor of God has come through Jesus Christ. Don't turn away from it. This is what they're saying. Look, the, he sent his spokesman. He sent his angels. He, he sent his angels to declare the coming of Christ because John 3, 17 says that God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Right? Not only did he send his angels declaring him, not only did he send his spokesmen, but the Lord Jesus Christ came himself. He came himself. John 8, 34. He that is a, a slave of sin, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. See it? Verse 35. And the servant abides not in the house forever. The servant will not be under the blessings and care and provision of God forever. The Lord right now is reigning on the just and the unjust. But the servant is going to have a final day. He's given his good pleasure to everyone right now in the house forever, but the son abides forever. You see it? Next verse. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. See it? We need the son. We need the son. And so he says unto them, he sent unto them his spokesman. He sent unto them his, uh, to turn to, uh, Proverbs chapter 1 in your Bibles. He sent unto them his spokesman. 
he sent unto him them the angels uh, unto us, not unto them, unto us, and he sent unto us himself, the Son of God, who is the wisdom of God. The Bible calls Jesus, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, one twenty four that he is the wisdom of God. He is our wisdom. And the wisdom of God came on this planet and was crying out to sinners, Come unto me, come unto me, come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He is crying out to sinners. And because the wisdom of God cried out in the streets, if we ignore his wisdom, you're going to get what is deserving of the foolish. Look at what it says in the Bible. Are you guys there? Proverbs uh, 20. Proverbs 1, verse 20. Are you there? Look at what it says. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. You see that? And it's called a she there because wisdom bears fruit. Wisdom has fruit in the womb. If you follow after wisdom, if you follow after right understanding, there will be a fruit that will be benefited and produced in your life. If we follow after God's word and do things his way, he promises there will be a fruit that will be a birth in us. Wisdom, she crieth in the chief places of concourse. In the openings of the gates, in the city, she uttered her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. You see that? Why are we turning away? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all of my counsel and my word, none of my re and, and would none of my reproof. You didn't want none of my word. You didn't want to follow me at no points. You don't want to follow me when it comes to getting along with people. You don't want to follow me when I tell you to, to forgive people. You don't want to follow me when I tell you how to treat your wife, how to treat your children, how to be able to engage in one another. You don't want to follow me when it comes to relationships, uh, uh, marriage. You don't want to follow. You want to do your own thing. When it comes to uh, coming to church, you don't want to follow me. When it comes to being gentle and loving and caring, you don't want to follow me. You want to do your own thing. And if we follow after that way, we reject the wisdom of God. You don't want to follow me. Look at, look at it. It says, verse 25, But you have set at naught all my counsel, and with none of my reproof. I also would laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. When your fear cometh, as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall you call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. They're, listen to me. Now is the time to call upon the Lord. Don't think that when you make it to, to tomorrow, oh, I'll do it then. Tomorrow is not promised. And so, believers, today is the day to worship God. Honor him with everything that is in you. All we have is today. We ain't got tomorrow. The Lord opens up a door for us. Open your mouth. Right? We, it's not promised. All we have is today. He says, then, verse 28, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For they that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel. They despise all of my reproof. Therefore, shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. You see it? And so the Lord calls us and has sent forth his knowledge in this world. Listen, so there won't be no excuse. He sent his prophets. He sent his angels. He sent his son. 
he sent his wisdom that is crying out in the streets unto man. Will we not hear him? Will we not hear him? Oh, Lord, give us grace to hear you every day of our life. We will not be able to say that he did not give us ample witness. Yes, he did. And you know what? We won't be able to say he didn't understand me. For y'all that have kids, you probably know. They get in trouble and you say, no, you, you're, you're getting in trouble. Oh, no, but you don't understand, Dad. You don't know what it's like, you know. You know, my situation is different from your situation. You know, you don't under understand. I'm different, you know. I'm, I'm, you, you, don't, you don't get me, right? You don't get me. You know what they say? You don't, you, you don't understand, Dad. See, it's different from when you, was a, when you were younger, right? Uh, now, you know, now things are different. People, this thing is different. You don't, you don't get it, but we won't be able to say that about, about Jesus. Jesus. Because he was a real man. Hebrews uh, 4, 14. And he is a priest. That's not separate from our infirmities. He's not separate from what we go through. He's not separate from our temptations. Look at it. Seeing them that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Go to the next verse. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You see it? And so uh, he is able to understand all of our conditions. We will not be able to say that God didn't understand or know our conditions. Listen, we have troubles in this world where I know that we can feel really alone. And even like nobody knows. And I think of that old song. I like the Louis Armstrong version. It goes like this. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down, oh yes, Lord. Sometimes I'm almost level to the ground, oh yes, Lord. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen, nobody knows but Jesus, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, glory, hallelujah, hallelujah, nobody may seem to know, but I know Jesus knows, amen, Jesus knows, uh, next verse please, he knows, he knows. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. When we feel like nobody knows, you ain't been through what I've been through. There's nothing that the Lord Jesus Christ does not know. He took on sin. He knows the fullness of sin. He knows the fullness of rebellion because he put it on himself and he put it away. He became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He knows. He knows. Don't ever act like there is a, a no temptation that God cannot relate to. This is the beauty of his humanity. He came as a man. He knows every part of me. He knows how I think. He knows the temptations that come upon me. Bring it to him. Bring it to him. He's not separate from you. He's God, but he came as a man. That he might relate to real sinners. To real men, real women, real children. Not only does he know, but 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us to cast our care upon him. You know what? 
He cares for you. He cares for you. And if you walk away from that, you are a fool. He cares for us. Nobody may seem to know, but he knows. He knows the fullness of our sin, the blackness of our sin we don't even want to talk about. He knows it. And he's able to do something about it. Hallelujah. Because he came as a real man. He's able to fully relate to us because he came as a real man. He was one of us, one person with two natures. One person with two natures. And what I'm talking about here is point two, the hypostatic union. One person with two natures. The hypostatic union, two, pers- two natures, one person, a demonstration of the love of God. The hypostatic union, don't be afraid of that word. Hypostatic is, it mean, is personal. The hypostatic, personal union of God is the personal union of his two natures. Two natures, one person, okay? Jesus, a person put it like this. Jesus has two complete natures, one fully human and one fully divine. What the doctrine of the hypostatic union teaches is that these two natures are united in one person, in the God-man. Jesus is not two persons. He is one person. The hypostatic union is the joining, mysterious as it may be, of the divine and the human in one person. Okay? So did God change when he was incarnated? The answer is no. Did God change when he was incarnated? No, he remained the same. His taking on flesh did not alter his deity in any way. Did not alter who he was before the foundation of the world. Okay? Now, the, these things have been talked about for a long time. They were disputed. And the church had a council in 451. It's called the Council of uh, Chalcedon. And they, could, they created a creed to be able to explain uh, the two natures in one in Christ. And this is how they did that. I want to explain it to you. Chalcedon also gave us a standard orthodox definition, which is good to be able to help us, which says that the one person of Christ, uh, the one person of Christ is perfectly united, the divine nature and the human nature, and that this union is without confusion. There's four points. Is without confusion, without division, without separation, with, without uh, se- separation, I'm sorry, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. So we say without confusion because he is not two things mixed together to make a third. He is not uh, red and yellow make orange. You got it? That's not what he is. He's one person, two distinct natures. He is without change, which means that he did not change. The deity that he is is still the deity that he is, but he has two natures. Same person. He did not change. Without division, which means that he isn't partial one and partial the other. He isn't half God and half man. He's both fully God and fully man. You got it? The two natures uh, do not uh, represent a split in him in any type of way. The union of these two natures is real and it's organic and it's all in one person. There's no separation. You got it? Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Philippians 2, verse 6. I want you to see this. I'm going to turn it there too. In Philippians 2, verse 6, I want you to see this. I'm going to try to show you this in the scriptures, okay? In 2, verse 6, it says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery. You see this? It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5 says, let this mind be in you, which was, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form, being in the form of God, 
thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You see that? So you see where it says, who being in the form? Can we get uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 2, I think it is? Acts 3, 2. Who being in the form, that word there, being, actually is the word uh, hupoarku, hupoarko, which means uh, being or existence from the beginning. It's one's existence from the beginning. So when it says being in the form, okay, being in the form of God, it means his existence from the beginning was the form of God or the morphe or the nature of God. You got me? So... It, listen, look at it here. And a certain, okay, and a certain man, you'll see the word here is in this text. You may not notice it, but it is. Uh, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb. You see that? From his mother's womb? That's that hupo arco. That means from the beginning of time, from his existence, he was always lame. That's what it's saying. So in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, it's saying that, uh, who being, that means from the beginning of time, from before the beginning, when he existed with his father, he has always been God. That same one from the begin, beginning is the one we're talking about. The being having always been God. That's what it's saying. I like how other versions say it. I don't really like the King James here because it makes it a little more difficult. Uh, some of the versions will say, in him being God, in him being God, right? Who being uh, God, that word there being is, is, is actually means who from the, from the beginning, his existence was the form and that word there form, right? Actually, we're going back to uh, Philippians two, six, if you're there, that word form means nature. Okay. So who being always the nature of God. Okay. Always having the nature of God. Okay. Who being always having the nature of God, Thought it not robbery. He wasn't trying to go uh, uh, steal something. He wasn't grabbing at being God. Thought it not robbery to be equal to God. He wasn't trying to make something of himself by being God. But, and and declaring, it, it, declaring it everywhere. But made himself of no reputation. The, the word there means to empty himself. And in a sense, the, the God did as a man... Uh, shield or take off his glory because no man can see God in his fullness and what? Live. Okay? So there is a sense in which he did remove his glory. And he humbled himself. He humbled himself. Okay? But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form. See? That's the nature right there. You see it? He took on the form. So we just talked about one form. That was the form or the nature of God. And then here it says he took on the form of a servant, a slave, and was made in the likeness. That word there is the schema of men. So this other form was the form of mankind. Got it? The form, the nature, or the schema and the schema of mankind. The form talks about internally what he was. And then where it says, uh, I'm sorry, the servant who was made in the likeness of men. That's the form of men. That's the nature of men. And then in the next verse, verse 8, it says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That verse 8 where it says in fashion is the schema. That means that he acted like a man. He showed himself was a man. He ate, he, he sat, he slept, he did everything as a man. What I'm trying to show you here is that there's two natures, but it's one person. You got me? Two natures in, in one person. And so that is what we mean by the hypostatic union. And that's what the, the Bible actually declares. Now we're going to take a quick look at it. I just want to give you a sample of it. Remember when uh, Jesus was uh, sleeping in the boat? He's going on the other side of uh, the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> and he in there sleeping, right? And there's a storm outside. And, <laughs> and the, uh, the apostles are in the boat, Mark 4, 36, and, and they're in the boat. And they're like, Lord, don't you care about us? We're about to die. The storm is raging. He, he in there sawing wood. He in there sawing wood, right? Because he was a real man. He in there sawing wood. They get up and they say, Lord, don't you care nothing about us? And he gets up and he goes out to the sea 
And what does he say? Shh, hush up. And the storm stopped. And the waves stopped moving. And he brought peace. You got it? This is what the Lord Jesus Christ is able to bring to our souls. Peace to the raging storm. He is the word of God that brings order to the chaos. Okay? And so, um, at the same time, he's showing that he's God and his man at, and man at the same time. Two natures, one God. Absolutely beautiful. The incarnation is not about transformation. It's not about him changing. It's about him revealing who he was, right? Uh, John 1, 18. Um, in ver- in, we saw John 1, 14 where it says, And the word became flesh, and he what? Dwelt among us. And John 1, 18 tells us, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath what? Declared him. He has uh, made him known. Uh, He has revealed him unto us. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that actually shows us what the Father is like. Who the Father is. the, the, The holiness of the Father. He came, he had to come and take on the wrath of God because God is holy. And he shows us the grace of the Father. The great love of the Father. By which he sent a savior, a mediator between God and man, right? To be able to save us. And so he declares the beauty of the Father, the mercy of the Father when he came and was a man. Because he was, there's only one mediator between God. First, first Timothy 2, 5. There's only one mediator between God and man, it says. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. You see it? Now, as a mediator, he had to be that one. You guys know what a mediator does? A mediator is the one that actually works out an issue between two parties. So sometimes, you know... (laughs) You, you sign a contract, and they don't want you to, uh, to be able to sue them. They say, no, 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 you got to do mediation, right? <laughs> Which means that you got to bring your uh, case before uh, a qualified individual that understands both your side and their side, where they can bring peace in between both of you. So the mediator is that one who has to be able to stand between man and God and make peace. And this is what he did. He stood between man and God and in his body, being stricken in his own body, brought about peace for us. That's what it was necessary. The mediator, right? Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. And he had to be a man because man was the one that messed this up. By one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And death passed upon all men. How come? For all have sinned. Sin came into this world by man. So man had to actually fix the problem. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2.14. He says, For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh... Much in are the children uh, partakers of the flesh, because uh, the children of God are in the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Because we're flesh and blood, he had to come as flesh and blood. That through death, you see it? That through death, meaning that the reason that he actually took on flesh and blood was to die. Because God can't die. Right? And the wages of sin is what? Death. So the only way that the full payment could be made is by the death of a man. You and I have to die. And God in his graciousness, it before the foundation of the world, placed us in Christ so that when he died, we died. 
And when he rose again from the dead, we rose again with him with newness of life. And it says here, for as much then the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy or disannul him that had the power of death. To break the power of death, which is the devil's power to bring you into temptation and sin and then, and then uh, uh, go to God and accuse you. Accuse you before the judge. Get him, judge. He's a liar. She's a thief. She's an adulterer. Get him. Get him, Lord. He could accuse us. He's an accuser of the brethren. But the Lord Jesus Christ came to actually die to sin so that there could be no more accusations in the courtroom of God toward God's people. There is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, right? Uh, Romans 8.1. And so he says here, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Meaning that because we were on a path to hell and destruction, we live according to a fear of death. But now that he has already destroyed death, he has already took death for us, there is nothing for us to fear. Hallelujah. We don't need to fear death. Now, we may not want to die, it may be hurtful to die and leave people behind, but we need not fear it because on the other side of death is only glory because of Jesus Christ. <laughs> glory, glory is already ours. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And guess what? When we get there with it, we're going to enjoy all those spiritual blessings. Amen. Praising him all of our days. I can't wait. Um, and so, uh, Hebrews 2.14. So, yes, he delivered us from the fear of death and the bondage of it. Be, because it was necessary to be able to pay for sins by death. And so... Um, The Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he came as one person with two natures, as a hypostatic union, to be a real mediator for real sinners. And then finally, point three. <clears throat> Luke tells us he came and was a man. And this verse shows us some of the components of his humanity. Mm. And this verse uh, shows us some of the components of his humanity, in humanity, which we should imitate. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, that he grew. You see that? He grew and he increased, which means that he increased. He grew, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and filled with the wisdom and filled with wisdom and with grace and of God was, up, and the grace of God was upon him. And so he grew. Right. And when it says that he grew there spiritually, it's talking about uh, in his mind, mentally and cognitively. He grew physically and psychologically, emotionally and spiritually. He increased over time, just like we need to do. And if the son of God had to grow, doesn't that mean we got to grow? You may be at this point right now, but you should be going to this point. And you should be striving to be able to grow and go further and further and further down the path. But it's a process. It don't happen overnight. And so, uh, so we are called to grow. And we grow, 1 Peter chapter 2 says that we grow by desiring the, the milk of the word. That's how, well, how do I grow? You grow by reading God's word. You grow by being around God's people. You grow by remaining under the preaching of God. You grow by meditating on his word. You grow by following his word. You grow by submitting to his word. That's, what, that's how you grow. And the child grew. Oh, uh, uh, 1 Peter 2, 2. Uh, we grow by consuming the milk of God's word. 
until we grow up and we're able to handle the, the meat, and then we can to eat upon the meat and feed upon him. We grow by feeding upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our bread. He is our drink. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of what? The word that you might grow thereby. Jesus Christ is the word at which we grow thereby. We feed upon him by following him and learning of him. That's how we grow. Are you learning of him? So here, yeah, here we go. How come I'm not growing? How come I'm not growing? Are you feeding upon his word? Or do you have a morsel here and a morsel there? And then go and ask God, how come I'm not growing? Why do I feel stuck? Why do I feel like I'm not leaving, uh, going and advancing? Drink his word. Drink his word. Study his word. And if you don't know how to study, get around someone who knows how to study. And get up under their wings and say, hey, how, what you doing? What you studying? I want to study with you. Okay? But don't isolate yourself. We have Bible study here on Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday. And if you need a ride, call me. And so we have to be up under his word, okay? So we're, we're called to grow in his word, and we're called to grow in the knowledge of his word. 2 Peter 3.18, if we can get that up. 2 Peter uh, 3.18. I want you guys to see in your, in your, in your Bibles there, John 7.16. Have you guys do some more flipping here. Second Peter 3.18 tells us, but grow in grace. And in the knowledge of what? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever for more. Amen. And so we're to grow in his word. And uh, Jesus uh, was taught of God. Look at what it says here. John 7, uh, 16, if you're there. And it says... Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not my own, but is that sent, sent me. Doctrine is teaching. In other words, he was taught from the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ was taught by the Father. John 8, 26. Can we get that up? He was taught by the Father, which means he actually had to submit himself under someone else to be able to learn. You are not taught just by going out on your own. You actually have to submit yourself unto others who are faithful in the study of word, led by the Spirit of God, so you can learn. I have many things to say and, say and, and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. So you know what that means? That the, the son was actually hearing from, from God, and he was taught of God. His ear was open unto God. You know what that means? He was available to hear from the Father. He was willing. He was ready to hear as the perfect Son of God. Are you? Are you making yourself available? Are you ready? Are you willing to hear from God? Yeah, ask the Lord, Lord, make my heart more soft to your word, that it desires to open and learn of you. When I leave this place, when I leave this place, open up my ear, Lord. The Bible is the word of God. When we close the book, we close ourselves off from the word of God. The church is the body of Christ. When we leave the body of Christ, we're turning our back on the presence in a certain type of way or, or the influence of God. So we need to be in his word and we need to be around his people. Yeah. But Jesus, the Bible says, ah, man, I don't have time to go into this. So the, 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 uh, the Bible says that uh, Jesus learned uh, by obedience in John 5, 8, Hebrews 5, 8, if we can get that up. It says that he learned by obedience. He learned by the things that he suffered, that he had to go through, right? 
So I know this is a crazy thought for God to have to learn anything. But as a man, he learned what obedience was by going through suffering, by his experience. By his experience, he learned. And so we learn by experience. Listen to me. The things that happen in your life are not happenstance. God actually controls all things everywhere at all times. If he's allowing it to be in your life, it's for a purpose. Don't we, we, let's not act like, oh, why is this happening to me? Uh, you know what I mean? It's happening to you because that's what God has put before you at that moment. Be a good child and turn to him and say, Lord, what, what is it that you would have for me? Hebrews chapter 12. This is, I know this is hard. I'm not saying that this is an easy thing, but the Lord has provision for us. Mm, let's see. Hebrews chapter, actually, let's turn there in our, our Bibles. Hebrews chapter uh, 12. Can we get a, a Isaiah 11, 1 up? Hebrews chapter 12. It's verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction. See that? Such ignominy, such uh, 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 trouble that he had to go through of sinners against himself. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Consider him how to keep from fainting. You have not resisted unto blood. See that? You ain't died yet. You're going through something, but you're not dead. The Lord didn't make it cost your life. Don't you know that the apostles and the prophets, they had to die for the testimony of Christ? They had to die to be able to live to the glory of God? You're not there. You're just struggling on your job. He can work through that. You have not resisted unto to, to blood, striving against sin. And you have forgotten. And, and when, you, when it says it's striving against sin, I want you to remember, now we're striving not only against our own sin, but the sin of this world. That's trying to bring you into subjection. To bow to it. Bow to it. Bow to it on your job. Call that man a woman bow to it. This is what is happening in our world. We're fighting against this. But the Lord has provision for us. And, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Remember, you're, you're God's children now. Remember, you're God's children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you have, you are rebuked of him. That word there, chastening, does not mean corporal punishment solely. Okay? It's talking about the instruction of the Lord, the teaching of the Lord to bring about the peaceable uh, fruits of righteousness. For whom the, uh, whom the Lord loveth, he what? Chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So he calls us to endure to endure for, uh, it says, we're going to drop down to verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. We know it hurts, but grievous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Those that actually want to work through it. Looking to Christ, working through it, will bring about righteousness, the peaceable fruits of righteousness in your life. That's God saying that, not me, okay? And so he, he grew, and he had wisdom. He walked in wisdom, and the Lord, I can't even imagine this, the Lord Jesus Christ as a young child, full with wisdom, okay? Because when it says that he had wisdom, he was filled with the, he had the Spirit of God, 
Then he says that he operated in wisdom in Isaiah 11. One says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Uh, Next verse. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the spirit of of wisdom and understanding, the uh, spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Okay. And shall make of him. Uh, make him of quick understanding in what? The fear of the Lord. See it? The, meaning the reverence of God, not the quaking before God and shaking and trembling, but the reverence of God, respect of God, acknowledging God, trusting God with all our heart, leaning not to our own understanding, but acknowledging him in all our ways that he might what? Direct our path. That's what he's talking about here. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. Neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but he shall judge, but with righteousness, keep going, that's fine, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his, not, of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And so he's going to judge with righteousness. And this is how we're called to judge. Wait a minute, you ain't supposed to judge. You better judge. You better judge. You better make a decision about if that thing is right or wrong. You're just not supposed to judge on the outward appearance, but judge according to righteousness. Who's righteous? The Lord Jesus Christ. That means judge according to the word of God. Make your decisions about whether what that person said is right or wrong or off or on the right point according to God's word and nothing else. You better judge. Um, and so, uh, we are to judge and Psalm 72, four, he was filled with wisdom and we are to walk in wisdom, which basically is to trust in the Lord and to acknowledge him in all our ways. He shall judge the poor and the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. Okay. And so he shall judge this judgment is talking about a judgment that he's actually going to uh, bring upon the poor. He judges the poor with righteousness. In other words, those that come to him who are poor shall find provision and righteousness for their soul when they stand before God in the last day. He blesses the poor. He blesses the poor and... uh, Let's see here. Yeah. Let's look at Proverbs 15, 25. Remember we were talking about on, on Friday, we talked about the widow. The widow is one of, one of the characteristics of a widow is that a widow was poor, right? Well, Proverbs 15, 25 tells us that the Lord will destroy the house of the proud. Well, he will establish, he'll provide for the border of the widow. That's the poor person that comes to him saying that they don't have any righteousness in and of themselves. I cannot be made right with God. I'm poor. He'll bless them. He'll provide for them. And he will uh, put a border for them. He'll protect them. Amen. And so he, uh, he uh, came and he grew. He learned. He was filled with wisdom. And he had the favor of God upon him. He, uh, John eight twenty nine. we're almost done. In Romans, Romans, uh, turn to Romans 8, verse 1 in your Bibles. We're going to stop here. John 8, 29, it says, Jesus is declaring his righteousness. And he says, and he that sent me is with me. The father hath not left me alone. Listen to it. How come he didn't leave him alone? He didn't leave him alone for a reason. For I do always those things that please him. He had the favor of God and the blessing of God because he was perfect in and of himself as a son of God. As a man, he was perfect. And God loved being with him. 
because he was always right. You see, sin separates, but he had no sin. And so God was always with him because he always did those things that pleased the Father. He had a perfect righteousness. Now look at uh, Romans 8, 1. Therefore, is there, there is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. There's a result of that who walk, not after the flesh, but after the spirit of God. For the law of the spirit, the law of the spirit, the rule of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. There's a law of the spirit that has been applied unto me through the work of Jesus Christ, which has made me free from the penalty of the law of sin and death, okay, has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak. In other words, the law was not able to be kept through the flesh, through our own flesh, because we're weak. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a man, and for sin, to take care of sin, condemned sin in the flesh. See it? He condemned sin. He ended the power of sin. And he ended the rule of sin over us. And he ended the requirement that we had to keep the law perfectly to be right with God. Because he kept it in himself. Condemn sin in the flesh, how come? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled. Where at? In us. In us. So his work of his perfect life actually provided something for us and should be working in us. That means that righteousness should be operating in your life if you are saved because you already have the Lord God operating in you with all power to execute his will. Trust him. Lord, increase my faith that I might believe on you and trust you. And it says that the righteousness of God might be fulfilled in us who walk after the flesh, not, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Because the Son of God came as a man and gave his life for me, I have life because of him. Amen? Amen. Amen.